Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In the last unit, we talked about how we can simplify our rule set to only three rules, the specifier rule, the adjunct rule, and the complement rule. Now this makes a prediction. It makes the prediction that our system will distinguish three different kinds of modifiers. So in this video, we're going to talk about those three different kinds of modifiers with a particular focus on the difference between uh, uh, modifiers introduced by the complement rule and modifiers introduced by the adjunct rule. So remember we have these three rules, the specifier rule, the adjunct rule, and the complement rule. The specifier rule uh, starts with an XP on the left, so some kind of phrase, noun phrase, verb phrase, adjective phrase, and on the right there's an X bar head and the thing that sits um, to the left of that in parentheses the YP is the specifier. Adjuncts are introduced by this rule that is self-recursive. So we have an x-bar which goes to some modifier and an x-bar, or alternately an x-bar goes to some x-bar and a an modifier. And because there's an x-bar on each side of those arrows, that means that the rule is self-recursive and can apply as many times as you like. And we also have the complement rule which introduces the head and then the um, the modifier that is called the complement. So what are the predictions of these rules? What do these rules predict about structure? It proposes that there are really three different kinds of modifiers. There are specifiers, there are complements, and there are adjuncts. But it, we can legitimately ask the question, is this per prediction correct? Is it correct that we can distinguish among these modifier types? But we're going to leave specifiers aside for the moment and concentrate on complements and adjuncts and see whether or not they really do have different properties from one another because they are introduced by different rules and have different structural properties. So here's some formal definitions. When we talk about the specifier, we're talking about the non-head element that is the daughter of a phrase and sister to a bar. Right now the only example we have of a specifier is the determiner in noun phrases. And in fact, we're going to change that a little bit later on in a future unit. But remember this. This is the thing you have to be able to walk away and do in your sleep, that specifiers are daughters of phrases, sisters to bars. Adjuncts are daughters of bars, sisters to bars. So the ZP here is an example of an adjunct. It could have appeared on the other side too, and it still would be an adjunct, as long as it's a daughter of a bar and a sister to bar. Notice that these definitions, daughters and sisters, they entail that the relevant criterion is immediate dominance. So ZP is immediately dominated by X bar, and um, another X bar is immediately dominated by the same one. That's just a different way of saying daughter to bar, sister to bar. And complements are daughters of bars sister to heads. So the WP here in this structure is a sister to the head and it's a daughter of a bar. So remember these distinctions. Daughter of a phrase, sister to a bar, that's a specifier. Daughter of a bar, sister to a bar, that's an adjunct. Daughter of a bar, sister to a head, that's a complement. With those, this, those definitions in place, we can now test to see whether there are actually distinctions among these modifier types. So let's have a look at this um, tree structure here and look at what modifiers play what role. So first of all, um, our determiner is a specifier. It's the daughter of a noun phrase, sister to a bar. Um, all of the prepositional phrases and adjective phrases other than of linguistics are adjuncts because they are daughter of a bar, sister to a bar. So young is an adjunct, from Phoenix is an adjunct, with red hair is an adjunct. 
Our prepositional phrase of linguistics is daughter of a bar, sister to a head. So it's a complement. The head noun is student, and it's the head of the entire phrase. We have some terminology here. We have the head. We have the maximal projection. That's the phrasal level. So the, the N is the minimal projection, and the, the, the phrase is the maximal projection. All the other um, N bars are called projections of the noun. If you want to think of it this way, the head noun um, says, I'm a noun, and I'm going to create categories on top of me, so I'm going to project my noun-ness up the tree. So the N, the N bar, the N bar, the N bar, the N bar, the NP are all projections up the tree of that noun. Okay, um, before we go any further, we do need to revise our principle of modification because it's no longer the case that modifying heads are um, sister to the head. In some cases, as in this tree here, they're sister to the projections of the head. So, with a red hair is sister to a projection of the noun. And from Phoenix is sister to a projection of a noun. So, we need to make a slight um, difference in our tree, in our principle of modification rule that says um, an XP modifies some head Y, then it must be dominated by a projection of Y. So, it must be dominated by Y bar or YP. So that's our revised principle of modification, just to get that technicality into place. So let's distinguish complements from adjuncts in terms of their structure. Take this noun phrase, the student of linguistics. Here, the prepositional phrase of linguistics is drawn as a complement to the head noun student. That's because it's sister to the head and daughter of a bar. We can contrast this with a uh, a structure like the student from Phoenix, where the prepositional phrase from Phoenix is drawn as a daughter of a bar, sister to a bar. That makes it an adjunct by definition. Here's a quick way you can distinguish prepositional phrases in English noun phrases. Um, Complement noun phrases are almost always marked with the preposition of and almost always other prepositions mark adjuncts. This is just a uh, heuristic for you to remember to help you keep track of things while you're going along, because that's not in fact the definition of a complement versus an adjunct. But you can quickly identify whether a prepositional phrase is a complement or adjunct by whether or not it has that preposition of or some other preposition. Okay, now here are some predictions of these structures. First of all, complements are always closest to their heads. This is by definition, right? Because um, if you look at your tree here of linguistics, if it is going to be sister to the head, it has no choice but to be adjacent to that head. Um, and we can see that, in fact, this prediction is true. You can say the student of linguistics from Phoenix but you can't, in English, say the student from Phoenix of linguistics. We'll talk about other languages a little bit later, but for now, that's true of English. The student of linguistics from Phoenix is fine, but the student from Phoenix of linguistics is just awful. And that is predicted by our distinction between complements and adjuncts. Now, uh, another prediction of our theory is that you can only ever have one complement, but you can have as many adjuncts as you want. And this is because of the nature of the rules involved. The complement rule does not uh, self-recurse. It is not iterative. There is an X bar on the left-hand side of the arrow and an X on the right-hand side of the arrow. So it doesn't feed itself. By contrast, the adjunct rule has an X bar on each side of each arrow. So X bar goes to ZP X bar, or X bar goes to X bar ZP. So this means that the adjunct rule, you can apply as many times as you want, which means it give, gives you as many adjuncts as you want, but those complements, can only, you can only ever have one of them. So we can see that this is true. The student of linguistics with red hair from Phoenix in the bath is fine, 
Um, this is a case where we have multiple adjuncts with the red hair from Phoenix and in the bath, but we have one complement. Contrast that to the student of linguistics of chemistry from Phoenix. This is ungrammatical. You can't have two complements. Um, there is an interpretation of this sentence where there is a study of linguistics of chemistry. That's not the meaning um, w which we are in intending here. We're intending the, the meaning where the student is of linguistics and of chemistry. Note that you can, in fact, conjoin those two complements, a fact we'll come back to in a minute. Another property is that because the x-bar rules um, are nonspecific with respect to category, um, you're going to find that complements, because they have to be adjacent to the head, um, are fixed in order, whereas adjuncts can be put in any order with respect to each other. So for example, you can say the student of linguistics from Phoenix with the red hair on the bus, the student of linguistics with red hair from Phoenix on the bus, the student with red hair on the bus from Phoenix, etc., etc. But you can never reorder the complement. This is a restatement of the previous observation as well. The student from Phoenix of linguistics with red hair on the bus, terrible. The student from Phoenix with red hair of linguistics on the bus, terrible. The student from Phoenix with the red hair on the bus of linguistics, it's terrible with the intended interpretation where of linguistics modifies student. If there is such a thing as a bus of linguistics, that's a different structure entirely. Um, conjunction. So because you can conjoin things at the same or different level, um, sorry, only at the same level, um, you're going to find that you can only conjoin complements with complements and adjuncts with adjuncts. You can't conjoin conjuncts with, uh, conjuncts with adjuncts. So um, our conjunction rule for now is, looks like this. The little superscript N stands for bar or phrase or word. Um, so the N is a variable that spans over um, those things that modify the hen the head. So um, this could be x bar goes to x bar conjunction x bar, or xp goes to xp conjunction xp, or x goes to x conjunction x. And what we find is that um, this rule does seem to be correct. You can conjoin like things. So you can uh, conjoin uh, two adjectives. You can say the red and blue house, but you can't conjoin um, an adjective and a noun, for example, the red and cat is terrible. So what we find, as I said before, is that complements can be conjoined with complements. So you can say the student of linguistics and, with philo and of philosophy. Note, by the way, that this does not violate our condition that you can only have one complement. Because what you've done here is you've taken two complements, conjoined them together, and made them into a single thing. And that single thing is the complement of student. Um, and you can conjoin adjuncts with adjuncts. So you can say the student with red hair and with its two. Um, but you cannot conjoin conjuncts with adjuncts, the student of linguistics and with red hair. Why should that be the case? Well, it's because complements have to be sisters to the head and adjuncts have to be sisters to the bar. And it's impossible to create a conjoined phrase that is simultaneously sister to a head and sister to a bar. So you just can't draw a tree that does that. All right, we have another test here. This is one we've actually seen before. It's the argument um, that we used for intermediate structure, which was one replacement. Now, one uh, condition on this, not every speaker of English has this phenomenon. So there are some of you who will not get the judgments I'm going to show you. And that's fine. You just have a different one replacement rule. But for those people who do have this rule um, in the way I'm, I've specified it, then in fact you can use this as a test to distinguish between complements and adjuncts. So for those people who have this version of the rule, you can replace an n-bar category with one but you can't replace an NP or an N with one. Those of you with the other dialect can replace an N. 
So what we um, predict then is that we should be able to put a 1 after the determiner and we should be able to put a 1 before from Phoenix but we should not be able to put a 1 before of linguistics. Right? So that is one way we can distinguish complements from adjuncts. If you can put a 1 in front of the prepositional phrase, it's an adjunct. If you can't, then it's a complement. So, let's try this. The student from Phoenix, not the one from Tucson. So that's an example of an adjunct because you can stick one in front of it. The student of linguistics, not the one of chemistry, for those people for whom this is ungrammatical, this is a test that shows that of chemistry is a complement because you can't put one in front of it. Now, if you are one of the people who finds this second noun phrase um, grammatical, what, ha what seems to be happening is in your uh, particular dialect or idiolect, your rule is targeting both the N category and the N bar category. So you simply can't use this test to distinguish adjuncts from complements. But for other people, you can. So we actually now see that we have a whole bunch of ways in which adjuncts are distinguished um, from complements. You can only ever have one complement. You can have multiple adjuncts. The complement, if it's there, um, must be closest to the head. Adjuncts can be separated from the head. By the way, note carefully that sometimes adjuncts are adjacent to the head. So it's the key is that they can be separated from the head, not their actual um, specific position. Adjuncts can be reordered, complements cannot. You can conjoin complements with other clear complements, you can conjoin adjuncts with other clear adjuncts. If you are a speaker of the relevant dialect, you cannot put a one before a complement, but you can put a one before an adjunct. Okay, now um, there's a very easy mistake for beginning tree drawers to make. So let's take this sentence, the big banana. And big is in fact an adjunct. You can say the big one, right? Um, you can, uh, if you have mul you can have multiple adjectives. So you can say the big um, rotten banana. Um, it can be separated away from the head, the big rotten banana. You can conjoin it with other adjuncts. So you can say things like the big and rotten banana. So adjective phrases are adjuncts in the relevant level. That means that they have to be both daughter to a bar and sister to a bar. But it's so tempting to leave off that extra n bar because of the trees we've been drawing up to this point using phrase structure rules, which didn't have this. You'll, if you drew a tree like the tree on the right hand side here, then what you've done is made the adjective phrase a complement. This is not correct. All the empirical evidence shows that it's an adjunct, which means it has to be a daughter of a bar and a sister to a bar. In my years of teaching syntax, this is probably the most common mistake that people make, is they leave off that extra bar when they have an adjunct where there isn't a complement. Now we also have the complement adjunct distinction in other categories. You can see in a sentence like, John often eats apples with a fork, the head verb eats here has a complement, which is apples, and it has two adjuncts, often and with a fork. Now, usually, in English, the complement is the direct object, and everything else within the verb phrase will be an adjunct. Um, that's a heuristic for you. That is not a definition. That's just a quick way for you to be able to tell what is an adjunct and what is a complement. Because apples is the direct object of eats, it has to be a complement. Um, there is an exception to this rule. The verbs give and put take two complements. And we're going to leave this aside for a little while because in order to explain these kinds of verbs, we need to understand movement. And movement doesn't come until a later unit in this um, textbook. Okay, 
Let's look at this, this noun phrase. I love the policeman intensely with all my heart. The tree for, for the verb phrase here looks like this one. We have the verb loved, and then we have a series of V-bar projections on top of it. We also have the mysterious VP on top. Just go with it, put it on top. Each of the adverb phrases and prepositional phrases are going to be adjuncts. So they're daughter of a bar and sister to a bar. The policeman is the direct object, it's the complement. It's the daughter of the bar, but sister to the head. Now we should be able to do tests like the ones we did before for noun phrases that show this distinction clearly. So um, let's start with, um, remember you can only have one complement because the complement rule is not recursive. So, I love the policeman, the fireman is terrible. That would be having two direct objects, not okay. Um, you can reorder adjuncts, but you cannot reorder um, complements. So, I love the policeman with all my heart intensely, I love the policeman intensely with all my heart, but you can't say I loved intensely the policeman with all my heart, and I loved intensely with all my heart the policeman. Now, if you're a speaker of Spanish, or French, or some other languages, you'll notice that the two sentences that I've marked as ungrammatical, if you translate them into your language, they're fine. We're going to come back to that. That's because your languages have a special property called verb movement that we will return to. Another test is, can you conjoin the items? So you can conjoin a complement with a complement, as in, I love the policeman and the fireman, and you can conjoin an adjunct with an adjunct. I love the policeman intensely and with all my heart, but you cannot conjoin the complement with either of the adjuncts. I love the policeman and intensely. The equivalent to one replacement in English uh, that you find with verb phrases is do so replacement or do to, do so too. So um, let's see what happens. Um, you can put do so before an adjunct, but you can't put it before a complement. So you can say Mary did so with her brain, Mary did so mildly with her brain, but Mary did so the fireman is just awful. So therefore, we can conclude that at least with verb phrases, there does seem to be a distinction between complements and adjuncts. Now when it comes to adjective phrases and prepositional phrases, you'll remember from an earlier video that the evidence for x-bar theory in these forms is not strong, but that's simply because they typically have very restricted amount of modification that can happen within them. Um, so it does seem to be the case that there is, um, there is a distinction between adjuncts and complements uh, in these forms. So for example, you can say, very afraid of, tar of tigers, where afraid is an adjective, and very is an adjunct, and of tigers is a complement. And similarly, with um, the, this fixed phrase, in love, you can be very in love with himself, right? Where um, uh, himself is an, with himself is an adjunct, love is the complement or, or object of the preposition, in is the head, and very can be an adjunct as well. The distinction here is primarily for parsimony reasons, that is to make the theory pretty. But it, um, we might predict that there are similar distinctions to what goes on in noun phrases and verb phrases here as well. Now, we haven't talked about specifiers. Um, the reason for this is the only element we've seen so far that's a specifier is the determiner, and in fact, in the next unit, we're going to argue that even determiners aren't actually specifiers. So the specifiers are going to be a bit of a mystery for the moment. Um, I've already told you before, you just have to take it on faith that the specifier rule exists. But we're going to argue a little bit later that we do have a role for specifiers. It's the position where subjects go. We just haven't seen the, all the data we need in order to get there. So for the moment, just understand the difference that um, uh, specifiers are sister to a bar, daughter of a phrase, and that's where we're going to put determiners for now.
But we're going to have to return to this topic because it isn't quite clear yet. So to summarize what we've talked about in this video, specifiers are sister to bar, daughter of a phrase, adjuncts are sisters to bar, daughter of bar, and complements are sister to a head, daughter of a bar. This makes a number of predictions about the difference in behavior between complements and adjuncts. You can only have one complement, you can have multiple adjuncts, complements have to be closest to the head, adjuncts can be reordered with respect to each other, you can conjoin complements with complements, adjuncts with adjuncts, and you can do uh, and you cannot do one replacement or do so replacement before a complement, but you can before an adjunct.